The content herein is for informational purposes only, not intended as medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, and is not to be substituted for direct advice from your doctor. Today's LymphCast program is proudly sponsored by Vita Support MD, the makers of Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000. These MPFF-based nutraceuticals are backed by science and recommended by doctors specializing in venous and lymphatic disorders. Visit VitaSupportMD.com to learn more. Well, greetings and welcome to our LymphCast show, episode 46. A reminder, every show is on YouTube and every show is on podcast land. Whether you want to watch or listen or both, you have your choice. Also, visit our website, lymphcastnetwork.com. Let's get going right away tonight. From California, a regular panelist, Dr. Emily Eicher. Hello, Dr. Eicher. How are you? Hello, team. Hi, Paul. And hello, wonderful guests. We are looking forward to your stories and share your stories with our podcast people. Yes, we are. Uh, the gentleman who started this show physician surgeon from New Jersey, Dr. John A. Chuback. Hello, Dr. Chuback. How are you? Hi, Paul. I'm doing great. Looking forward to a terrific show. Also wanted to mention he's the owner and founder of Vita Support MD. And of course, they make the products we've talked about on the show before, Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000. Now, let me bring in the CEO of the Chuback Medical Group. She's also the producer of the LymphCast show. And then she will take over from here, Dr. Diane Chuback. Hello, Dr. Diane Chuback. How are you? Hello, Paul. Hello, everyone. Very excited to be here today. Um, today's show is another very special, uh, special edition show that we are doing with LymphCast, and it is to promote and celebrate uh, this wonderful book right here, the Lymphedema United, You Are Not Alone book. And we have with us today, Matt Hazeldine, who was one of the co-authors of this book, and um, along with Amy Rivera, and again, this special edition show is featuring two of the authors that um, that have written their stories for this book. And it's, it's just wonderful. I mean, there's stories from all over the world of people with lymphedema and how the power of coming together, of uniting, of helping each other, of telling our stories is just so powerful. And that's what we're here today again to do. And um, so I first want to introduce Matt Hazeldine officially, and, and you've been on our show now for a number of times, Matt. We Again, we congratulate you on the book, and uh, we're happy to have you here today. Oh, thank you, Diane. And um, two amazing ladies. Um, I don't think you'll be disappointed with their stories. Uh, heart, heartfelt, lump in throat, watery eyes. That's when I read the chapters for the first time. Uh, two inspirational ladies. It'll be a great evening. Thank you. Yes. And, you know, I, I'm really excited to hear their stories because, you know, although uh, sort of the common thread um, in sort of the etiology of both of your lymphedema situations, come, you know, is, is through cancer, but two very, very different stories and, and so much to learn and take away from it, um, you know, especially the idea of the power of the mind, of, you know, just the perseverance. We're going to hear a lot about that message, I believe, from Angela. And um, and also just the idea of uh, that Jean's going to talk to us about, you know, her story, but also the importance of diet. And so these are the two main things that I'd love to, you know, really, um, you know, let our listeners know about uh, from both of you. So I would like to start with um, Angela Marquez. And Angela, you are coming to us from Colorado, correct? Correct. Yes. Oh, wonderful. I I would love to hear your story. If you could just give us some background of how this all sort of began for you, you know, just a synopsis of everything mm -hmm. you have in your chapter. And you are chapter 12 in the book. Um, yes. And yeah, and then sort of you know, a sense of where, how you've, what you've come away with that you really share with others to help them in their journey. My story is um, I was diagnosed with cancer in 2007, cervical cancer. And so with that, I had a radical hysterectomy, chemo and radiation. At the time, they took 36 lymph nodes out 
and my doctor or my team actually it, you know, at that time they did warn me that lymphedema was a side effect um but however at that time you know i just wanted to get through the cancer so i got through everything uh it was in 2007 and then that was when i was living in missouri moved to colorado life's going on you know going every three months for checkups and every six months and then in 2012 i get released from you know my oncologist so it's actually eight years ago um, this month that lymphedema presented although i did not know it was lymphedema it was not on my radar i did not even think that that would happen i was told if it would happen it would be like within three years so I noticed that my ankle was swollen, but I had tweaked my ankle in a parking lot. It just kind of rolled it, not a big deal. But then within a week, my entire leg was swollen. So I called my general practitioner. He's like, get to ER. Um, I wasn't even worried, but when he said get to ER, then I got worried. So I go to ER. They're like, oh, it's just your veins. You're, you're fine. Just wear a garment. And go back to your general practitioner. <laughs> and I was like, this isn't, this, something wasn't right. I go, a general practitioner was off. I see someone else. Oh, you're fine. It's not, it's not even that swollen. I'm like, this isn't normal. They're like, oh, it just happens with aging. So then I went to a vein doctor and, um, oh, because when I was at ER, they said I had venous insufficiency, go to the vein doctor. He's like, you don't have venous insufficiency. He goes, you don't even have any varicose veins or anything like that. But then he said, I think you have Maythurner syndrome. And I'm like, what is that? I had no idea. So then I started panicking because then he wanted to do an MRI, confirmed that I, I did have Maythurner. He's like, and I think you're going to need a stent placement. So I'm freaking out about that. Go back to my general practitioner who came in on his day off. And at uh, that time, he's like, because uh, I'm with UC Health, so I wanted to keep everything in, in the hospital. So he got me with an interventional radiologist. I went in in April and had the stent placement. But the interventional radiologist at that time, he thought that there was something else going on as well. He goes, so let's wait a month. Then when I went back, uh, that would have been, and so my stent placement was in April of 2016, and then I went back in a month. And the swelling had gone down, but not a lot. And then that's uh, when he confirmed that I also had lymphedema. And at that time, I honestly, that was really hard for me um, to take because I'd gone through the cancer and all the treatment. And I thought, how can this be happening now? Nine years later, I have this disease plus i had the stent so i was trying to process two things at once um and then it was just at that time i felt again that it was um i don't know if it was just you know anger and i'm like i have to channel this in a positive way and then that's when i just kind of made it like a personal mission of no i am not going to allow this to set me back i've come too far and then um that's when I just started trying to find out as much as I could. And I researched lymphedema and um, just, and here I am. Yeah. I mean, and that, that's amazing because not a lot of people go that, that long, you know, after, because the doctor did ask you, did you have a trauma? Was there something? And you said, well, I had mm -hmm. cancer. Mm -hmm. And now it's mm -hmm. all these years later and lymphedema is presenting and it's something, right. that, you know, doesn't, I would imagine doesn't normally happen. I mean, John can comment more on that, but, and Emily, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, from the standpoint, because the, the, the words that you use throughout your story, you use resilience, you know, dedication, mm -hmm. um, uh, resilience, self advocacy, self advocacy. Right. Right. Because I feel as though you truly, you know, learn these things and learn the value of them through mm -hmm. your, um, the journey with cancer. And then when this happened, right. Although it was another blow, you were probably, you know, so much stronger, you know, in your mind. Right. And it, 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 what's interesting is, and I don't know how this is going to sound, with cancer, it's like I had a radical hysterectomy. I had 35 rounds of radiation. I had six weeks of chemo. And then, you know, it was 
is gone as it can be gone, right? And then with lymphedema, learning that there is no cure, it was it, it it was it was just weird, you know. It's like I always said, cancer is the gift that sometimes just keeps giving, because <laughs> there's so many side effects from from all of the treatment. And then here, like I said, nine years later. Um, but that's when, I, again, like you said, I was like, I got to turn this around and use this energy in a positive way. And that's when I just kind of immersed myself and trying to look up, you know, all the information and got connected through a great community through social media. Right. If I may oh. interject, congratulations that you are turning it into a positive way. And Thank you. I have been practicing for over three decades. So I can tell you many stories and it's not that uncommon that you get a swelling or lymph onset of lymphedema nine years later. If mm -hmm. I can recall my longest patient, patient with longest onset of lymphedema, and it was way back when after breast cancer, when they did total radical mastectomy, mm -hmm. she came down with lymphedema 41 years later. Wow. And so wow. most of the cases, any kind of surgical intervention, secondary lymphedema onset is within a, a one year after surgery or uh, radiation treatments or completion mm -hmm. of the uh, conserva conservative con uh, radiation treatments predominantly. Right. But it's not uncommon to come back nine years later. In your situation, you didn't even know you had May Turner. And May Turner, no. uh, Dr. Chubak, uh, I'm sure, operated on many May Turner syndrome cases where there is a narrowing of the vein compressed by artery, iliac artery mm -hmm. in the groin. And so your lymphatic system and venous circulation was already slightly compromised even before surgery. Right. And then having the treatments and surgical intervention and excision of the lymph nodes, uh, you were perfect setup for having lymphedema. And from a lot of gynecological lymphedema patients that I have, initially they start to have swelling in the abdominal area or a pubic area, and then it progresses mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. lower extremities and so. But again, mm -hmm. compliments that you are doing so well and you are turning into positive way and uh, most likely with a lifestyle and dietary influence and exercise program, you will not progress with lymphedema. And right. it's known that I live, the reason why I am into this field is because instead of surgery, I developed lymphedema in my surgical residency. And I maintain my stage one lymphedema in my right lower extremity. And whenever I gain even one pound, I can see the difference. Mm -hmm. So again, diet, exercise, and lifestyle, and you will be happy with whatever we have. But then right. we can celebrate. We are here now. We are alive and we can smell the roses and mm -hmm. embrace what we have. So I'll let you mm -hmm. with well, I would say it's a remarkable story and one of the things is um I think that it sounds like uh we hear this this story again and again which is so important for our listeners it seems like you also had rolled your ankle correct mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. in the parking lot yeah sometimes these relatively minor traumas that occur years later can be that inciting event that sort of pushes the lymphatic system just over the edge. And sometimes when people are born with a bit of a hypoplastic lymphatic system, I always remember, you know, Matt's story that started so kind of innocuously and then sort mm -hmm. of spun out of control. And so many people begin with a little bit of a, a bite or mosquito bite or spider bite or cellulitis for some unknown reason, a minor trauma that in most people will resolve in a week or 10 days. But in people who have some compromise of the lymphatic system, in your case, it was obviously post-surgical, which was obviously right. life saving for you, which as Dr. Eiko says, is fantastic, fantastic. Right. And I'm so happy that you've, you've, um, you've lived and you have a full life. And mm -hmm. the, the, as you said, it's unfortunate that cancer was the gift that came, kept on giving. <laughs> 
you were cured of the cancer, but you right. had this complication. The Mayturner syndrome, in your case, I think is a fascinating aspect. It's mm -hmm. it would be unclear for me to know what um, contribution that was really making to your edema since you had not had a swollen leg from Mayturner syndrome previously. Sometimes mm -hmm. we as physicians, um, we're looking for answers, hoping that we can solve something. So how much relief the venous stent gave, it's impossible for me to say in retrospect, looking back at your situation. But mm -hmm. hopefully it was indicated and hopefully it was helpful because by your own admission, you did feel that the swelling did improve somewhat after the mm -hmm. venous stent was placed. Um, right. So, so that's that's fantastic. Um, it it I think one of the teaching points here for all patients who have had what we call lymphadenectomy, removal of lymph nodes, whether in a quote unquote radical um, style, meaning a large number of lymph nodes was removed for for diagnostic purposes, or in the more contemporary style of um, uh, lymph node biopsy that can be a uh, guided sentinel node biopsy where only one or two mm -hmm. lymph nodes may be removed. I think every patient who has had lymph nodes resected, either a small number or a large number, should always try their very, very best to be very careful with the limb involved, limb or limbs. In the case mm -hmm. of the pelvis, it would be both both lower extremities. In the case of a unilateral breast cancer with lymphadenectomy or lymph node biopsy, it would be the upper extremity. And I've talked about this many times on the show that uh, Emily knows very well. Historically, we surgeons were taught to avoid any trauma whatsoever, even a minor trauma. Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000 from Vita Support MD are backed by science and sold in doctor's offices. If you're a physician who may be interested in prescribing or selling these excellent nutraceuticals, please call 862-246-7877 to speak to a representative today. In the arm, in the extremity after a uh, breast cancer and lymph node dissection, to the extent that we were advised never to take a blood pressure on that arm, not okay. to draw blood from that arm, not to start an intravenous line on that arm, because tragically, sometimes a patient who is, as Dr. Eicher pointed out, and you're pointing out with your story, can be many, many years removed from the cancer and the, and the surgery, even a minor um, trauma, like taking a blood pressure, which seems mm -hmm. inconceivable, can set off this, this lymphedema um, cascade. And to be honest, I'm not sure that we fully understand how that happens and mm -hmm. why it happens in some patients and not in others, because so many right. people have a radical. In the old days, there were many more radical mastectomies do, being done, for example. And mm -hmm. they might have an IV put in that arm. They might break that arm. They might have a lot of trauma to that arm and never develop lymphedema. Right. And now in modern times, you have a patient who may have had only one lymph node removed as a sentinel biopsy, and they have a minor trauma and the arm blows up um, massively. So I'm not sure we understand all of the pathophysiology and the anatomy of that yet at this point, but um, suffice it to say, if any of our listeners out there have had any lymph node resected for any purpose, please, please, please be extra super careful and avoid trauma and be your own best advocate in terms of not allowing anyone to take a blood pressure in that arm, to, to start an IV in that arm, be very cautious about surgery in that limb if it's a lower extremity that's elective surgery, et cetera, et cetera, because these things can happen. And um, you're here to to share your story, Angela, to tell you that it can really alter the path of your whole life when one of these things happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's interesting is I've met other women uh, who've had cervical cancer and have lymphedema I've probably met seven different women that also have made donor syndrome that were diagnosed with that after. Hmm. That's, that's, that's an interesting thing. Uh -huh. And again, 
the May Turner again is a is a diagnosis that has like everything else levels of severity. So there are there are people with severe May Turner who've never had any kind of pelvic sur surgery who wind up with a painful swollen mm -hmm. lip. That could be a very right. extreme compression of the iliac vein from the iliac mm -hmm. artery. And then there are those who have a very borderline that might be clinically um Un, unimportant, meaning that the patient has a bit of a narrowing of that vein, but the limb feels fine and looks fine. And then mm -hmm. it's, as Dr. Eicher was pointing out, only one additional problem has been added, in your case, removal of lymph mm -hmm. nodes. And then the third event, possibly, it sounds like the inciting event that really tipped everything over was the was the minor trauma on the, on the rolled ankle. So right. it's... Um, it's a fascinating combination of of events and anatomical um, issues that you had, but uh, we see we see what the the result was. And um, how are you doing now, Angela? Bring us up to date. Oh yeah, now I'm doing well, um, like normal. I can still exercise. I mean, I do all the things I used to do prior to having lymphedema. My leg is very stable. Um, I did have the, the vascular lymph node transfer um, with Dr. Okay. Diane, and um, I had that in 2017. So my leg has been very stable. Uh, thankful for that. But again, I think it's attributed to exercise. That's, that seems to be the biggest thing for me, wearing my compression and then uh, diet. That's what now, I'm, 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 ask, oh, I'm sorry, on. if I may ask, so you had vascular you had lymph node transfer where was the uh, donor site was it from your uh, the, yeah the omentum and one lymph node two lymph nodes do you know i don't Doesn't remember matter. are you wearing compression stocking yes every okay. day what happens if you don't you know i i'm comfortable around the house um i can go a couple hours and it and then it might, especially at the ankle, might start to swell a little bit. But when I go out, I, I still wear um, my compression because it's... So this it's is a remarkable outcome because you had 30-something lymph nodes excised. So overall, right. compliments, number one, you are very diligent. Number two, you are very positive and you are taking care of yourself. But mm -hmm. this is fantastic that with such a insult to your lymphatic system, giving the excision of the lymph nodes and also radiation treatments and may turn a maybe contribution <laughs> a little bit. You are doing remarkably well. So compliments, you. compliments. You are you should be the shining star for the lymphatic <laughs> with your medical pathology. So my I bow continue. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, as they say, lymphedema is progressive diseases. It, yes. it's not necessarily progressive as as the books are this all the books are describing so mm -hmm. and you are proud mm -hmm. example so compliments right thank yeah. you and that was one of the things that i pursued this the surgeries i wanted to do everything i could in my power to try to diminish um or manage it without it progressing but dr diane did say that because of everything i'd gone through that it probably wasn't if I would get lymphedema, it was more of when, because of all the events, like you said, that happened. Well, compliments, yeah. and yeah. Dr. Diane is fantastic surgeon, a mm -hmm. microscopic plastic surgeon. And if I would have known that you had Dr. Diane, I would have posted his picture somewhere. He is oh. nice and tall guy, and when oh. I stand next to him, I'm <laughs> his waistline. We're going to have to very have tall. We're going to have to have him on, on the program. That's sometime. what I thought, John, yes. Yeah, because yeah. We've, had, we've had Vino, uh, Vino uh, uh, lymphovino anastomosis surgeon from Mayo Clinic on the program. We've had um, liposuction surgeon, Dr. Harkin Borson from Sweden on the program for lymphedema, which was a remarkable show. But we have not had a lymph node transfer specialist yet, and we, and we certainly will. With that, Angela, it's a fascinating story, but because we're on a little bit of a truncated yep. time today, I want to yep. make sure that Jean gets her, yes. her yes. due share, and we're dying to hear her story and share her experience. So, um, Diane, why don't you introduce Jean? Yes, of course. So let me now introduce uh, Jean LaMantia. 
You are from Toronto, Canada. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and your chapter is number 16 in, in the Lymphedema United book. Um, and you are a registered dietitian. That's right. Yeah. And now your your journey looks like it began with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Take us take us through what happened. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to speak and to share my journey. And thank you again, Matt, for um, inviting me to the podcast and for including me in the book. So my journey started at 27. So I was very healthy. I was athletic and fit and working out. And I was already a dietitian. I had done my honors degree. I had done my clinical internship. I had worked a, an inpatient contract and now I was working a contract at a diabetes education center. And I came to work and I said, oh, boy, this stiff neck, this is really bothering me. And then the next day I said it again. And the next day I said it again. And the nurses, because I'm working all with nurses, they're like, Jean, you better go get that checked out. Like that's day three with the stiff neck. They don't let you get away with anything. So I went to the doctor. And the only thing I could say about this stiff neck that was remarkable was one, it wasn't going away. And two, if I had alcohol, the pain from this stiff neck would radiate all down my arm. And it was sort of this numbness and tingling and, and pain. And the solution for me was, okay, I just wouldn't drink and then it wasn't a problem. And the doctor said, that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. But she took an x-ray and, but there was nothing else to it. And shortly after that, that contract finished and I was an adventurous 27 year old. So I packed a backpack and I enrolled in language school in Mexico. And I went off on this adventure to learn Spanish and travel all around Central America on what I call the chicken bus, right? And go through Belize and Guatemala and Honduras by myself as a backpacker. And the one thing I noticed, I was tired. And I would mention this, people say, oh, it's the altitude. All the tourists have this problem, it's the altitude. And so I finished my adventure and I came back to Canada and I happened to be in a mall and they were having a blood donor clinic. And I had been a blood donor four times before because um, everybody in my family is a nurse and my mother just like, you gotta be a blood donor. So I'm like, okay, I'll donate my blood. I'll get my card stamped for the fifth time. So I did my blood donation and boy, then I wasn't feeling well. My, my throat was swollen up, it's getting pain in my chest. I'm like, I am coming down with something. So I went to the doctor and they said, oh, you've got bronchitis. Here's the antibiotic. And by like three days later, my mom was like, you should be better. Get back to the doctor. So here I go again. And this time they did a chest x-ray and I was saying, oh, it's so heavy, like things feel so heavy. And this was the first time that my family doctor called me at home and said, I need you to see somebody. I'm, I'm going on a trip, but this can't wait. You need to see someone. And he wanted to see a respirologist. So my mother is like, do you have tuberculosis? <laughs> like you've been in these, you know, in Central America. What did you pick up when you were there? Um, and then it turns out that was the beginning of my diagnosis of lymphoma or lymph node cancer. And I, I, once I started reading about it, one thing caught my eye when it said that it sometimes reacts to alcohol. It's like, oh, that took me back to like six months later when I had that stiff neck and I drank that drink and that pain radiated down my arm. Like That's what that was. But I think what happened is my immune system was able to keep it in check. So yes, I was tired when I was traveling. But once I went and donated a pint of blood at that blood donor clinic, whoa, my immune system was compromised enough that it was growing fast. And of course, I called the blood services. I said, do not use my blood, whatever you do, because they don't know what I've got, but the choices are both cancer. So I made sure that that didn't get passed on to anyone. And then that began all the staging and each appointment was about a week apart. So a week to get the, the biopsy where they remove the lymph node, a week to wait for the pathology, a week to get the CT scan. And at this time I was deteriorating fast. 
And I remember my mother being on the phone. She was my advocate because, you know, at 27, I wasn't too much of an advocate for myself. And I remember her talking, saying, yes, yes, it's a new diagnosis, but this girl's going downhill fast. And if there's any other staging you need, like we need to get her in. So they said, we need a bone marrow biopsy. So by the time I arrived at the hospital for my bone marrow biopsy, I could hardly breathe. I could talk like this. And what was happening was all that lymphatic fluid that my lymphatic system is supposed to be draining, it was going into my lungs. And I was drowning in my own body is what was happening. And I had, it was the lymph nodes in my neck, under both arms and in the middle of my chest. In the middle of my chest, the mass was 15 centimeters. So that's a grapefruit size. Um, my doctor described it as remarkable. So they did the bone marrow biopsy and they didn't let me go home. They admitted me right away and I had my thoracentesis, which was a very interesting experience because they drained the lymph fluid through my lungs, out my back. And I could feel, you know, my breath going deeper and deeper into my lungs. It felt like my lungs were like crepe paper, like finally getting that fluid out. They were really uh, expanding. Yeah, it was. It really was expanding. I did many thoracentesis and things as a thoracic surgeon, and it's a very gratifying thing to see a patient be able to breathe again, really. It was almost like too much breath. Like I wasn't <laughs> used to it. It was, it, it was like well, too it's much It's true. When the, when the lungs, when the lungs re-expand, the, the pleura can be kind of painful and it and and the little alveoli when they pop back open, it, it can actually take your breath away in a sense. You're absolutely right. Yeah, very strange experience. I remember turning to look around and seeing these two jars of like murky looking liquid that they had taken out. So that began my journey with um, my treatment. So I followed up with six months of chemotherapy and then a month of radiation. And I remember, you know, this idea, like you count down every, every chemo session, every read, and you start using the fractions. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm one quarter done, I'm half done, you know, at least that's the way my mind would work. And it was interesting because after they, okay, you're done, they release you, you think you're going to be so excited and euphoric to be finished, but it actually began a different stage where it was a stage full of anxiety and a stage full of hypervigilance. And when I'd go back for my three month checkup, I think, oh my, is this, is this one they're gonna tell me that it came back? Because I thought when I came out of that last radiation treatment, this is what it was picturing in my mind. And for people who are listening, who've been through cancer treatment, they're thinking, Gene, does it work like that? Well, I know that now, but at the time, I thought when that big lead door would open, my oncologist would be standing there and he was going to shake my hand. And I thought he was going to say, it worked, you're cured. That's not what happened. The radiation techs just called the next person. I'm like, well, when is he going to tell me that I'm cured? And so when I go back for these three month checkups, I would get so anxious. Oh my God, is this when they're going to tell me it's come back and it's back again. So that was a real, um, anxious time. And I remember it led up to a point where I had my first alcoholic drink after treatment. And as you recall, in my history, that was, you know, something that was really significant. And I got a headache. I got this month and I thought, oh my God, it's back and it's spread to my brain. I've got brain meds. Oh my gosh. So I called the hospital. I had them page the oncology resident. And I said, I'm a Hodgkin patient. I just had my first alcohol since treatment. Now I have a headache. I think I have brain mets. And he laughed at me. And it was so humiliating. He said, you don't have brain mets. You're just hung over. I said, no, no, no. I've only had one drink. I like, and I could hear myself. It was like this out of body experience. I'm trying to convince this man that I have brain mets. And he's it, like, it just felt so humiliating. And then this little voice in my head is like, Gene, you have got to get a grip. Like your anxiety is out of control. And so because I was a dietitian, I'm like, I can do this. I have the skills, right? 
So I am, you want to know what a nutrition nerd looks like? Here it is. So I just hit PubMed and I was reading every bit of research I could and everything I could get my hands on. And really, I, I started to develop this picture. I'm not powerless in this situation. There are things that I could do. And once I started reading about it, I could develop this mental checklist. Okay, you know, I more fruits and vegetables. Okay, got that. You know, exercise, got that. You know, getting sleep, got it. You know, and it helped. It helped calm things down. And I wrote a book. I wrote a book to help other people going through cancer treatment. And what happened was one of the people who read that book was a lymphedema therapist who lived near me and had an exclusively um, lymphedema clientele a lot of whom had had cancer. So she thought, I need to help them with their nutrition. I need a dietitian who understands nutrition. Let me call this gal who wrote this book and see if she can help. And so I said, sure, I will help you out. So I joined her clinic and we didn't get a lot of training on lymphedema. And I'm in Canada, so I have access to certain resources for professional dietitians nothing on lymphedema. I'm also registered in the US. I did my US credentials, nothing in the US. So again, I nerded out on all the research. I'm like, okay, I'm finding stuff. There's things here, there's things. And as the clients would come in, I'd try different things with them and it was working and it was helping and, and it just, it hasn't stopped. And I consequently wrote a book with that lymphedema therapist talking about nutrition and she's talking about CDT and I've done lots of blog posts and now I have classes, I have group classes and I've, I've done a lot of speaking and I'm trying to educate people about the power of nutrition for lymphedema. And I'm also trying to educate dietitians and I'm proud to say that I'm actually been accepted to speak at FENCI, which is the world's largest nutrition conference. And I will be speaking in the main stage about nutrition for lymphedema and lipedema and why dietitians should be involved and why nutrition matters. So it's, Good it's for you. really Congratulations. Thank you. Quite an accomplishment. At Vita Support MD, we believe in creating the best bioflavonoid based supplements to support your vitality. Bioflavonoids are found in abundance in nature and support excellent health and wellness. The demands and stresses being put on our bodies in these challenging times are unlike any we have seen before. Support your body with the flavonoids it needs to fight inflammation and oxidation. Unlike other products in the marketplace, Vita Support MD dietary supplements use micronized flavonoids for optimal absorption and effectiveness. Micronization is an advanced process which creates an ultra-fine powder easily absorbed by the body. At Vita Support MD, we are passionate about making your good health our life's work. And it's quite what a, a compliment. For you. What a compliment. Before I have to check out, I'll ask you with your lymphoma, did you have a night sweats? Yes, I had night sweats. Yes. For time. Yes. Yes. Besides yeah. the alcohol thing. But compliments. Thank you so much for such a great contribution. We, I am a co-author of the Lymphedema Lipidema Nutrition Guide. Yes. And we are. Whenever I see a consultation, I guide them with nutrition as well, which is so very important. But what a great con contribution, both of you, fantastic ladies. So uh, yeah. I hope to see you again sometimes. Yeah, thank if you. If you have any questions, uh, you can contact Dr. John or Dr. Diane or me and we'll share our information and our expertise with you. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. Emily, yeah, I just I, want to I, say I, before I, you go, Emily, I love, I love, love, love Jean's picture from the book. So many of the pictures are so great. But what I love about it, she's with all of these citrus fruits, and it reminds me of the bioflavonoids that, <laughs> that <laughs> right, we, all, right. we all need. It's such a great picture, and I like your short, your short haircut there. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was 
I'm t- and then the thing I always notice in that is I've got the coat on and my scarf because it's like outside in Canada, right? It was actually Toronto, yeah. cold that day, but I added natural color to my cheeks, I guess, with the cold air. It's yeah. a fabulous photograph. Yeah, thank you. Emily, thank you. Thank you, Emily. See you next <laughs> So that's a remarkable story. Uh, Jean, yeah. do you, is your book still available? Do you want to give a shameless plug? Sure, yeah, a that? shameless plug. Yes, okay. We yeah, we can't. Let see. me unblur my background. Yeah, yeah, do that. I want everybody to buy her book. I want everybody. Oh, to thank you. It. Yeah, so I end up co writing it with the lymphedema therapist that originally called to invite me into her practice. Beautiful. Um, so, yeah, it's a complete lymphedema management and nutrition guide. So it Wait, hold has, it up again. I want to read the rest of the subtitle for everyone to hear. Empowering strategies, supporting recipes, and therapeutic exercises. Is it available on Amazon? How do they get that? Yeah, it's available on Amazon. Right. And um, my co-author, she did all the photography. She set up a photography studio in her clinic. She, she had patients volunteer to be photographed. So she did all of that. It's all in there. And I did, all, you know, the recipes and um, recipe analysis and, you know, and listen, it's fully referenced. So if there's other nerds out there that uh, like, honestly, whenever I get a book, I always flip to the reference section. <laughs> That's my favorite part. But um, yet lots of strategies. And I teach a class called Lymphedema Nutrition School. It's a um, hour and a half for 10 weeks. It's a it's a group program just like this on Zoom. And I had my last session yesterday for the my January group. And we were summing up and what was fascinating as we went around, everybody had a different strategy that really resonated for their lymphedema. It was fascinating. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, there are these overarching strategies that work, but it's like everybody had something different, which I love that they all figured out what their, that their thing was, right? What the secret sauce was for them. Yeah, I think that that's pretty common what we hear from all of our guests that it's it's not exactly the same for everyone. And I think I kind of got that from your story as well that, you know, test out different things, see what works for you because it's, you know, everybody's slightly different, their body chemistry, their, you know, physiologic and yeah, anatomic situation. So, I'm know. a big one for that. I even I developed this journal so that people can track that. So this is how it looks. You track your lymphedema and your self-care and your nutrition. And it's it's that opportunity to say, oh, look, my lymphedema is looking really good here. This, this pattern of self-care and eating, this is what works. And okay, this day, there's a problem here. What was it? You know, maybe was it this thing that I ate or maybe I left my... Um, my compression garment off longer that morning. You know, it helps them figure it out. That's fantastic. I want to also mention, in addition, since Emily mentioned it from time, we don't mention it enough. Also for our listeners, look up, it's available on Amazon. I see it here, Lymphedema and Lipedema Nutrition Guide, Foods, Vitamins, Minerals, and Supplements. And actually, this is one of the areas where I learned many things about making our supplements at Vita Support MD based on the on the recommendations from Emily Eicher and also of course Dr. Karen Herbst is 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 listed here. And then of course Lymph Lymphedema United, you're not alone, this book, Matt Matt and Amy's book, I want everybody to have. I think the more, of course, as a doctor and a surgeon, I've been a great student my whole life. And meaning not to say I've been a great student. I mean I've been a dedicated student and have read and read and read and knowledge is power. I think everyone should get all of these books and read all of the books and take from them uh, what's most meaningful to them and what works for them. And But the more knowledge, the, the more vast your library, the more vast your resources, I think it can only be um, better. Now, I'm going to have to sign off in just a moment. But before I go, I'm going to ask Angela. Angela, do you have anything like that, a book or a website or anything of, of that nature that you wanted to share? Um, actually, I just, I'm just uh, i on Instagram at Funky Lymphedema, uh, just kind of spreading awareness and advocacy and thriving. 
Yeah, so. Angela and I have been uh, um, linked on Instagram through that funky lymphedema for a long time. Uh -huh. It's a great, great site. And uh, Jean, anything else that you wanted to share in terms of your site? Yeah, so I'm at, on Instagram as well at cancer underscore lymphedema underscore dietitian. And my website is my name, jeanlamantia.com. If anyone did want to join Lymphedema Nutrition School, it, I run it four times a year, but it's starting again April 23rd. So it's very timely if people are listening right away, they could That's join. Wonderful. It's wonderful. a great community. That's terrific. Yeah. And also, um, Angela, I mean, I, you, you've been very vocal with the LEARN organization as well. So Yes, I'm a volunteer. Yes, yeah. so that that's the Lymphatic right. Education and Research Edu Network, which right. is um, one of the preeminent organizations for lymphedema, lymphedema advocacy, and um, and you're running some workshops and speaking. Correct. Yeah, um, there is actually a support group. Um, yeah, our Colorado chapter, whatever we can do, like fundraisers. Um, we had been doing local walks and runs, but as of 2020, everything kind of became virtual. So um, maybe one day we'll get back to that, but we would do that. And so, right, any speaking engagements and support groups, we participate in that, so. That's wonderful. So you've, you've both gone yeah. through gone through so much, but you've both made such tremendous contributions to the field in general. You know, to the people out there who are just kind of coming into this and and just starting their journeys, and um, you know, hopefully they won't have it so so hard. You know, because there there are advocates and, and speakers and people like you who are putting the information out there as resources for them. So thank you very much for all that effort and everything you do. And I want to thank Matt Hazeldine for bringing these two wonderful ladies to us today because I think all the information that we heard and they shared was has been absolutely incredible. So thank you, Matt. Oh, my pleasure. I mean, we know that uh, healthy lifestyle, exercise, nutrition is so important, part of the four cornerstones. Two fantastic examples of that with Angela with her superb fitness regime and Jean with her nutrition. So yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, so it's been a great show. Um, Paul, I think we're we're ready. You can kind of sail us out into the sunset for tonight and uh, look forward to the next show. All right, we will do that. We want to thank uh, Dr. Emily Eicher, who had to leave a little bit early. Let's also thank the gentleman who started this show from uh, New Jersey, physician surgeon, Dr. John A. Chuback. Thank you, Dr. Chuback, for everything. Thank you, Paul. It's been a pleasure as always. A great show. I look forward to hearing more from these two phenomenal dynamic women and i thank them for their time and and for being so candid and open with our viewers it's very meaningful and very important very much so he's also the founder and owner of vita support md they make vein formula 1000 and lymphatic formula 1000 and let's thank the ceo of the chuback medical group she's also the producer of this show dr diane chuback thank you diane for everything Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And everyone, I hope you took note of the, the books that we mentioned today. And of course, Matt's book that I have here, wonderful stories and just really powerful. Uh, there you go. Mm -hmm. See, And uh, the book is getting around. We have about four or five copies floating around our office as well. Um, so, and there's just the beauty of uh, disseminating this type of information and education. It just empowers us all. All right. We also want to remind everybody, every show is on YouTube. Every show is on your favorite podcast platform. And also check out our website, lymphcastnetwork.com. That concludes tonight's show, Lymphcast, episode 46. We'll see you next time for episode 47. Have a great night.